Howdy, it's Mr. Pete 222, also known as Tubal Cain, and this is video tips number 200, so I'm celebrating uh, my bicentennial here, I guess you could say. And if you're new to these uh, videos of mine, you got 199 others to watch. And today what I'm going to do is uh, show you how to make gears for your Craftsman Atlas lathe. Now in the last video, I showed you how to make uh, gears for a Logan lathe, and to some extent this is similar, but uh, these gears are constructed a little bit different, so I'm going to run through this, and then uh, these gears are going to be made, or a gear is going to be made for this on the Bridgeport Mill. I've made a whole series of videos on the dividing head and cutting gears, so if you haven't seen these. Here's a rundown of these starting with uh, video tips number 190 and I'm presently on number 200. So look through those because some of what I'm going to tell you today uh, is a duplication but by the same token I am uh, glossing over some other things that have been repeated several times so you need to go back and see these others if you haven't already done so. So stand by for gear cutting for the Atlas Craftsman Lathe. Actually all of these Atlas gears here did not come off the lathe I just showed you. Uh, they're off of an older Atlas that I have out in my cold garage right now. And I don't believe that uh, this gear cluster here has ever been used because that lathe was converted over to a uh, quick change gearbox so the uh, change gears were evidently not needed and I had to pull out this nail here and I believe this was made during the war because these gears are put onto a, a wooden peg rather than uh, steel whereas the Logans were mounted on a big steel bolt but I suppose they were trying to save material Now I'm just deducing that but this is just to show you a sample of these gears now some of the gears are cluster gears where there's two together and I'm not going to deal with those at all these uh, Atlas gears are die cast. They are not cut gears and there you can see the four ejector pin marks that uh, press them out of the mold and uh, really these Atlas lathes were made much cheaper than Logan and other brands because just think of in uh, casting one of these uh, coming out of a mold how much faster that is than making one uh, on a milling machine or on a hobbing machine so it was a, a fast cheap easy way to make gears. Now these gears are not aluminum, they are of an alloy called Zamac. And there are many other parts on an Atlas lathe also that are made of Zamac alloy. And that's a trademark. Now what does Zamac stand for? Well look here, it's really an acronym I guess you would call it. It contains zinc, aluminum, magnesium, and kupfer, kupfer. Well, kupfer is uh, German for copper. So those are the alloys that are in these gears. Now you may have some gears or some parts on your uh, lathe that look to be decayed and deteriorated. And that, from what my uh, reading and uh, studying uh, tells me, means that uh, they used some zinc that was uh, not pure. So the good gears were made out of 99.5% uh, pure zinc made by the New Jersey Zinc Company. And I remember the New Jersey Zinc Company in Depew, Illinois when I was a kid driving by that and I never saw a wooden fence that long in my life. Must have gone on for a half a mile. I would have hated to paint that thing. But uh, New Jersey zinc supposedly was used to make these and you know zinc is sacrificial so I think when you see some of that decay well, we got that uh, sacrificial business going on so enough for what these are made of and they seem to be pretty tough I haven't ever stripped any but uh, I don't think as tough as cast iron or steel but uh, I think that's how Sears 
was able to sell things cheaper by having things made uh, in a cheaper manner. Not necessarily poorly made, but uh, made uh, differently. And you can see the ejector marks on these other larger gears as well. And of course they put holes in there to save material. And this is the gear that I'm going to duplicate. It's a 32 tooth. And of course I'm not going to uh, put these uh, recesses in there. There's no need for that. But notice that the hub on these is a little thicker than the, the gear itself. And there's two keyways in there. I don't know why there's two. I'm only going to put one in. But uh, this is 32 tooth. But I had to laugh. Whoever made this mold 50, 60, 70 years ago when they stamped the 32 in there, they did not have the right number stamp because they needed to be reversible ones. Well, since he didn't have reversible ones, he used, well, a 3 wouldn't matter. That would work either way. But uh, the 2 ended up being backwards, of course. And here's another 32 tooth gear that was stamped correctly. And that was stamped into the mold, so that's why they needed uh, reversed numbers but during the war you know there was all kinds of shortages so maybe they were just trying to to get by and that man was told ah that's good enough go ahead and stamp it that way they'll know what it is and we did know well first of all we need to get all the dimensions off of this and determine the pitch and on this uh, 32 tooth gear I'm coming up with uh, about 2.1 one two thousandths but when I measure the other one you can see it's just a little different and we'll get to the bottom of that because remember these are molded not cut or cast not cut so I'm going to determine uh, the diametral pitch by what I just measured here and then I'll also determine what the diameter truly should be and that was shown in other videos also but let's let's find out how to find out the pitch so we can use the right cutters and so that all the uh, gear teeth mesh they all have to be the same pitch and here's how to determine the pitch of a 32 tooth gear now, if your gear is not uh, marked, and many are not, count the teeth. Mark the first one with a marker. Go all the way around and count them and do it two or three times so you get it right. But here is the formula to determine the pitch of a 32 tooth gear. Formula is pitch equals number of teeth plus 2 over the diameter. So that's 32 plus 2 over the diameter of 2.112 divided out and it equals 16.098 now I always told you forget about the change that's a 16 diametral pitch gear now here's two alternate ways of doing that here's another method of finding the diametral pitch and you're going to find these uh, these uh, silhouettes here for involute uh, gear teeth in most of the gear books uh, Reminds me of a song, Two Silhouettes on the Shade. Remember that? Actually, you guys are way too young. You'll never remember that. But, taking the gear and just matching it up till you find the right one, we'll see here that it fits the 16 pitch. It's not going to show up in the, in the video here, but it does match. But use the mathematical method. It's far better. Here's a set of gear tooth gauges used to determine the pitch of a gear mounted on a key ring. Here's another type of gear tooth gauge set up pretty much like a thread pitch gauge. I think I told you I was highly suspect of this diameter that I checked with the caliper because these came out of a mold and they have to have a little taper on them as well so I don't believe that's the right diameter and I just confirmed that by this formula that I've shown you before in other videos but to determine the diameter of a gear for the gear blank 
use this formula. Uh, diameter equals number of teeth plus 2 over the pitch. So that's uh, 32 plus 2 over the pitch of 16 equals uh, 34 over 16. Now divide it out. The diameter, the correct diameter, should be 2.125. That's 2 and an eighth. Now in red there is what I measured and it's semi-close but uh, we want it to be closer and uh, evidently it doesn't matter that much for something like this and as my dad would say it looks like something that Sears made when Roebuck wasn't looking. Well we're gonna go by the 2.125. In order to make my gear blank I need some other dimensions so I am uh, using my calipers and you know this is basically five hundred thousandths and then out here I'm getting about three 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 but I've I've measured a, a bunch of different gears and they're all a little different so I'm going to have to uh, arrive at a consensus I think I'll make it point three five zero the bore is three quarter and the keyway is a three sixteenths and then on this one I need to allow enough room for the keyway so that hub part that I'm going to turn down I think I'll probably turn it uh, to that that diameter I'll write those dimensions down if you're going to make one of these larger gears you need to come up with some uh, gear stock of the right uh, diameter or the right material don't just start with a piece of hot rolled steel and band saw it out because you're just really going to struggle with that it would be nice to find a piece of cast iron but I suppose nobody's actually going to do this so it doesn't matter but I did start with a piece here of uh, material and th this is actually 12L14 and it is uh, about two and a half diameter so I have to take it down quite a bit. I've already faced it on both sides so that I have that uh, 500 thousandths thickness so that's done and I drilled this and then I bored it and then I reamed it so that I got a real good fit for my brand new three-quarter inch lathe mandrel and that's going to be pressed in there And that's the next thing I'm going to do. I got it started. I'll press it in. I'll put a little oil on here. I would like it to end up about in the middle of the mandrel here. And I explained what a mandrel was in the last video. And I did have to buy a three-quarter one. That was uh, seventeen dollars with postage. And uh, notice it's got a flat spot. And the three-quarter end, the end that's marked, is the large end. And it's about a thousandth over three quarter. That's about a thousandth under three quarter. And it's virtually exactly at uh, three quarters, 0 0.750, about in the middle here. Remember, it's hardened and tapered. All right, the mandrel has been pressed on. The lathe dog tightened down onto the flat. And that's the large end. They didn't provide a flat on the other end. Most of them have a flat on both ends. Now I'm going to uh, turn that to the diameter and with the, uh, the little step on it and all of that uh, off camera and I'll be back when that's done. The lathe work is done. It's turned down to 2.125 330 thousandths this way and I just slipped that other gear on there temporarily for comparison. Now we're ready to select the gear cutter and then mount this on the milling machine. We're making some progress. This took about 15 or 20 minutes to turn down. Just a reminder now that all of these gear formulas and the gear nomenclature has been covered in another video and you can find that in many different handbooks and the machinery handbook and be sure and study that. 
remember that this is a 14 and a half degree pressure angle involute spur gear that we're cutting. There's a whole page of formulas and some of those we'll be using or I have already given you the information. But if you recall from seeing this book, now this is the Brown and Sharp book, that there are eight cutters in a set, but you don't have to buy the whole set. They are expensive, probably about 50 bucks a piece. But in a 16 uh, Demetro pitch, again, there are, 60, there are eight cutters. And we're going to be cutting, what did I say, 32 teeth. So we need to select the number four cutter. And that cutter is capable of cutting anywhere between 26 to 34 teeth. So that is the cutter that we want. And I've already mounted that on the machine. So I'm going to show you the information that is on another cutter. Now this is what I mean by uh, the thickness of the cutter. And every cutter in a set is going to be a different thickness. There's no rhyme or reason. So measure that and write it down. I, I have already done that because uh, before I mounted it on the arbor. And that cutter that I'm going to use is 204 thousandths thick. Looking at uh, another cutter in that set, this is the number six, 16 pitch, it'll cut anywhere between 17 to 20 teeth, and the depth of the tooth, or the whole tooth depth, is 135. On the other side, there's some other information. But I wrote that down too, 135. Now, if you do not have that or you did not read this off of your gear cutter, or some cutters may not have that on, but all the ones I've seen have, you, you can calculate that too according to one of the formulas. Now, those formulas that I just showed you on a page in that book uh, are capable of finding just about any of the dimensions that you need for gear cutting. All right, that's all set. And we're finally ready to go over to the milling machine, talk, uh, talk about setting up the uh, gear blank and setting up the dividing head. We've done the easy part. I'm finally over at the Bridgeport mill and I've got the work mounted between centers here. One end of the uh, work held in this uh, dead center. And since I do not own a tailstock, I'm using my... Uh, a spin index as a tailstock, and I talked about how I set that up in the last video, so I'm not going to get into that now. And the other end is held in the center in the hard inch dividing head, my favorite little head. Remember, this has a 4 to 1 ratio, and I have tightened this bolt here so that there is absolutely no movement there on the dog tail. You can't have any movement. The cutter is mounted in my arbor, and that's a 7 8 uh, arbor with a 3 quarter shank, and that's held in a 3 quarter collet, of course. And the next thing that I need to do is to determine that the cutter is exactly at the right elevation, that is, on the center line of the arbor, the center of the gear right on this center and you can use that baguette and bagosh method that I showed you once but I'm not in favor of that so I'm going to touch off in the next little uh, sequence here and I've shown that so many times and there's probably different ways of doing it but this is the method that I like and I believe it to be quite accurate so let's take a look at that you need a tool bit or some other small parallel and this high-speed steel tool bit is ground and it's, uh, it's straight so it's just perfect for the job and uh, wiping the cutter off and then using a spring clamp I'm going to clamp that tool bit right onto the top of the cutter. Now I'm lowering the quill so it's fairly close almost touching the mandrel and I'm locking the quill for good. That's it. Now taking a, a feeler gauge, and this is 2,000 thick, and you could use paper or whatever you, you want to use, but you need to know the thickness of it. And getting around the back side here, I'm going to raise the table now. My right hand is on the, the crank, the knee crank. 
until I get just a little bit of a drag between the tool bit and the mandrel. And right there, just right. Now I'm going to zero out my knee crank. All right, that's on zero. Take this off, we're done with that. Now, let's look at this again. Remember the mandrel is a three-quarter diameter. So half of that is three-eighths or three-seventy-five, and we could say the, the radius, but I want to talk about halves here. So that's 375. And remember the cutter thickness was uh, 204, so half of that is 102. And I need to subtract that cutter thickness from the mandrel. And I come up with 0.273, and now I need to add that two thousandths for the feeler gauge. So I get a grand total there of 0.275, and I'm going to crank the knee up 275 thousandths, and then the center of the cutter is on the center of the arbor. Count to yourself when you do this. 100, 200, and 75. I'm taking the crank off of the knee and I'm locking the knee. That's all set and done. I already have that number four cutter mounted in an arbor, and the arbor has a three-quarter shank. It's held in a three-quarter collet. This is tightened, and notice that I've got it mounted such that when I turn the machine on into forward, that is the correct rotation for cutting. Don't ever run one of these cutters backward. It's a form cutter, and you'll dull it instantly. So I like to have it in, in that direction so it's going uh, clockwise. And I'll be feeding this way toward the dividing head and toward the large end of the mandrel, which tends to drive it on even farther should it be slipping. But this one isn't going to slip. But if you've got a bad fit, you don't want it to be pushed off of the mandrel. You want it to be pushed on to the larger part. But take care that that doesn't happen. So the cutter is ready to go. And the speed is uh, 660 RPM. This is steel. Oh, when I turned this down on the uh, lathe, I discovered it is not uh, 12L14. It is, in fact, just, I believe, 1018 steel. It was not all that free machining. Now let's set the depth of cut. Now I put some tape onto the, the work, onto the blank, and I'm going to turn the machine on and feed in until I touch off. That is, until I just tear the tape ever so slightly. Now, if you want to, you can use a, a paper or you can turn this by hand. But I turned it by hand in the last video, so I believe I'm going to come in under power, but I'm going to do that off camera. Okay, you can see that I uh, touched the tape, so now I'm touched off, so to speak. Now you older guys, a pair of optimizers and a flashlight are your best friend. So make sure you have both of those on hand at all times when you're working on your machinery. Make sure you got your safety glasses on because chips will be flying here presently. The tape can be taken off. And if you will remember, of course you wrote it down, that the whole tooth depth is 135 thousandths. So having backed this off away from the, uh, the work, using your digital readout if you have one. If not, you have to use the dials. Just going to move it in. 135 thousandths. right there and I'm going to lock the y-axis and the only movement of the machine will be allowed in the x-axis and that's the direction we're going to be feeding and if you uh, have power feed you can certainly use that I do not so I'll be feeding by hand but now comes the really hard part we got to figure out the dividing the indexing 
So that's our next step. You know it's so peaceful here in my basement shop and I just enjoy this so much and I'm very fortunate to have a good wife. I know I don't talk about her much because people don't want to hear that anyway. But she's totally tolerant of what I do and uh, does not give me any uh, trouble. You know I buy whatever I want. But then again I do not deprive her of anything either. So uh, alright that's enough of that but I, but I am thankful. Okay. Did I mention that it's a 32 tooth gear? Yeah, only 50 times. And that that hardened dividing head has a 4 to 1 ratio. Yes. Now there are four different plates for that dividing head. And I, I took them off, or took the one off. And all four of them are here on the bench right now. Remember on that uh, Cincinnati, there's only one plate, a very large one. And it is reversible, but it has the equivalent of the same number of uh, whole circles but we have to defi decide uh, how we're going to do the index how we're going to calculate the index for 32 teeth and what plate to mount on the dividing head and what whole circle to use and I've been over this and over this and uh, I know I'm repeating myself and that uh, but it, this is a hard concept for some people but using the same old formula that's in all of the books, 4 over the number of teeth. Now if you have a 40 to 1 ratio, that'll be a 40 over the end. But this is for the hard inch, 4 to 1. So it's 4 over the number of teeth, which equals 4 over 32. Or in other words, we need to, or I need to, uh, turn the crank on the dividing head four thirty seconds of a turn for each tooth. And I'll be going around four times because it's four to one. So it would be so nice if there was a whole circle with 32 holes. So I'll look through them and see. I made up this little cheat card years ago and it just tells uh, what the different number of whole circles are in the various plates. And as fate would have it, there is no 32 tooth whole circle. So, what am I going to do about that? So, I changed these fractions, and these fractions are all the same, they have the same value. So, I reduced it to 1 eighth. Well, there is no 8 whole circle. So, I doubled that into 2 sixteenths. That's, again, the same, has the same value as 1 eighth or 4 thirty seconds. You guys had fourth grade math. Arithmetic, actually, it is. I had to explain the difference to my wife the other day between arithmetic and math, mathematics, and that is not mentioned anymore. But, uh, and my grandchildren call their arithmetic math. Well, it's not math. It's arithmetic. Okay, point of order. I'll probably get some disagreements on that. So, is there a whole circle with 16? Yes, indeed there is. And here it is. Some of these plates are pretty well worn. You know, they serve their lifetime in a vocational school. And I have circled the number 16. So there are 16 holes in that circle, and that's the second circle from the inside. So that's the one I will be using. And I already took the liberty, and quite a liberty it was, of uh, counting these up. So, in fact, I'm going to be moving, I said 2 16, so that's two spaces for each gear tooth. So if I start here at 12 o'clock high, and I always do, I will move two spaces. That's one. I got a little red on there. Can you see that? One, two, and then the pin will go in there for the second tooth. Now I talk about spaces, or if you want to count holes, do not count the hole that you're in. It will be one, two. That's generally why they talk about spaces, because it's less confusing. And then after cutting that tooth, I will move one, two. And I've marked that. 
it's a good idea, especially if you've never done this before, to mark all of these. And you'll notice that there is a pattern here. And because it's a 4 to 1 ratio, I'll be doing this going around four times for 32 teeth. Now, is that clear as mud? And I will set the sector to span these two spaces. Although, in fact, I don't even need to use the, uh, the sector. I wouldn't have to because it's just so easy with uh, the spacing here. Now, when you, we're using a, a circle like this, or a plate like this that has a lot more holes, it's a little more confusing. This is an easy one to use. So let's go over and get this mounted. I sometimes feel I'm the last man on earth to own a hardened dividing head. And it's rather laborious to change the plates, but first of all I put it in this carrier. And that goes on. It's, rather, it's really precision built. Tighten this, and there are three screws that go one, two, three to hold the plate in place. And I always like to put the plate with the numbers 12 o'clock high, but that's I guess doesn't matter. And then uh, on goes the sector. And notice how that's built so that it can be uh, moved in and out to span the, the any number of holes. And then there's some spacers and here's the little uh, crank and plunger. Notice that's spring-loaded. I haven't been able to show that later, lately, or at all, rather. That tightens right onto the uh, main shaft there, and it's got a keyway. And uh, this can be loosened and then moved in and out on the slot here to any position, uh, depending on what hole circle you are using. And then there is a... Uh, retaining ring and some other spacers and a, and a nut so it's it's kind of a chore to change that but it's just about done the plate is mounted and it's ready to go and I'm virtually ready to cut my first tooth but do a rehearsal do yourself a favor and do a rehearsal and remember that I'm going to lock the lock up here each time I cut a tooth to prevent any uh, any movement because there's probably some backlash in this old uh, dividing head, but I'm in uh, the hole here right at the top, which the starting hole, which I'm going to call 12 o'clock high. So that will be my first tooth. Cut that tooth, rotate to the third hole, which is two spaces. Cut another tooth, that'll need to be advanced. Move to the next one. Now these are all circles, so it's going to be particularly easy. All the way around, and I will need four full revolutions, because I will be cutting eight teeth each time I make one revolution. All right, is that clear as mud? Let's cut some steel. At long last, I'm ready to take my first cut. Here we go. Be sure and back all the way out so you don't uh, strike the cutter on uh, the gear blank as you turn it. Now I'm going to unlock the dividing head and move it to the next space advance the sector lock the dividing head Advance. Remember, do not go past the hole. If you do, you got to back up. Lock it. Next hole, lock, 
sure and wear your safety glasses when you do this. And keep your work area clean. No rags laying anywhere near the cutter. Or for that matter, anywhere near the milling machine itself. And I'll show a few more teeth from this view. two spaces, lock, now when you do this Put your cell phone in the other room, turn off the telephone ringer on your house phone, close the door, turn off the radio, and concentrate on what you're doing, or you'll be sorry. There are only two teeth left to cut, so you can see the position that I'm in here in the dividing head, and that'll be uh, 231, and then 32 will be up here. And if I moved it yet one more, that would be back to the starting point. So this is the time of reckoning to see whether I have done everything correctly. to advance it. Lock it. And that will be the last tooth. And the time of reckoning will tell us whether or not we've done it correctly because will there be one skinny tooth and one fat tooth when we're done? There shouldn't be. It's looking good. I hope it is good. Of course, there's always a big burr on that back side. And then, on the dividing head, if I move it to back to the 12 o'clock position, that should be It seems to line up. Well, it certainly should. Now, I'll take it off the machine, and we'll go over to the bench and examine it. There she be. Let me take the dog off. I degreased it and blew it off. Looks good on that side, but of course this is the side with the burrs. So let me uh, go over to the press. I'll take it off the mandrel and take another look. Before I pressed it off the manual I put it back in the lathe and uh, filed it ever so lightly to get the burrs off on that side and that seemed to do the job and it's looking good. There's no skinny teeth, no fat teeth. They're all the same. Good fit. Only one thing left to do and that's to put a keyway in it. And I'm not going to go out into the cold garage where I have that equipment uh, 
Right now it's 10 below. So that'll be done at a later time. I'm not totally sure why there are two keyways in here. Unless one was just a spare in case uh, one got damaged. But uh, I haven't taken these apart or examined the gear train really on the Atlas lathe because I own two Atlas lathes as you well know and both of them have quick change gearboxes as well. so I really don't do anything with the gears. But I now have a 32 tooth spare gear made out of steel. And that concludes this video. Hope you enjoyed this little adventure. Even if you never cut one you may uh, just enjoy this for the sheer entertainment of it, uh, especially considering there is absolutely nothing to watch on a regular TV. And if you're anything like me, you spend a lot of time watching other people's machine shop videos. Thanks for watching. This is Mr. Pete Tubal Kane saying so long for now, and I'll see you on the next video.